Welcome to ARC Reentry, a CO2 guide for schools. My name is Christina, and I'm a data analyst at USGBC and master's student at Stanford University. I'll be going over the health impacts of CO2, the importance of measuring in schools, locations within a school and a classroom to measure, CO2 comprehensiveness score breakdown, and the recognition that schools get for measuring. Let's start by going over the sources of carbon dioxide in a school setting. As we exhale, we produce CO2. There are obviously more sources outside the schools, such as combustion of fossil fuels or forest fires, but in a school setting, the main source of CO2 is from occupants. Sources of high CO2 are low ventilation rates, faulty HVAC operating conditions, or high occupancy. So if you can imagine a cafeteria, for example, where windows might only be slightly cracked and doors are closed, this will indicate low ventilation. Then on top of that, you have the HVAC system off because it's not working, and then there are a ton of students in there. You can imagine it'll get pretty stuffy in there pretty quickly. The level of CO2 in, would be really high in this condition. There are negative health effects of elevated levels of CO2. They have proven to play a negative role in student performance. From a study of 60 schools in Scotland, CO2 demonstrated an inverse relationship with school attendance. An incremental increase of 100 ppm of CO2 exceeding 1000 ppm was associated with half a day of absence per school year. This meant that levels past 1,000 ppm meant more absences. And then another study of a Latvian school used student surveys and tests to examine CO2 and its relationship to academic performance. There was a moderately negative correlation between CO2 concentration and test performance as students performed worse during higher concentrations. Lastly, in another study, they found that when there was an average concentration of 2,900 ppm, which is really high, the students had a decrease in attention intensity of similar magnitude to skipping breakfast. And so aside from the negative health impacts I just mentioned, why else should we measure CO2? Much of the exceedances of CO2 derive from issues with HVAC systems or low ventilation rates. And so CO2 can be a great indicator for those. Also, given the numerous types of HVAC systems and operating conditions, Measuring CO2 is essential in ensuring well-maintained ventilation equipment. HVAC systems, both new and old, are susceptible to improper ventilation of schools. In 104 classrooms in Southern California that were retrofitted with new HVAC equipment, there were maintenance issues in 51% of the study classrooms. Problems with hardware, fan control, or filter maintenance were commonly found, but all of them were associated with underventilated classrooms and high concentrations of CO2. CO2 measurement, therefore, is necessary to ensure HVAC systems are delivering sufficient ventilation. There's also varying ventilation types that make each school's CO2 different from others. Seasonal variation changes our behavior um, and ventilation rates, making CO2 levels vary throughout different seasons. This is all just to say that CO2 is very difficult to predict and that we need to measure it. And now the goals of this guide for measuring schools is to support the health, comfort, and productivity of students and faculty. We also provided thresholds to help gauge a school's air quality. We'll demonstrate through a couple examples of best practices for measuring within a school. Finally, we'll show you schools can obtain recognition for measuring CO2. So when deciding where to place monitors and measure within a school, we can think about what goals we would want to achieve from measuring. Do we want to find the average or maximum CO2? Do we want to see whether our HVAC operating conditions are ideal? For each goal, there are different strategies to measure, and we'll go over each one. So first, for finding the school's average CO2 levels, some things we'll need to consider are whether you want to take into account non-classroom spaces like cafeterias and libraries. There are reasons for both considerations. If you only want to measure spaces where students spend most of their time during a typical day, then measuring classrooms exclusively works. If you want to measure any place where occupants are during a given school day, then non-classroom measurements work as well. In that case, you can consider the ratio of classrooms to non-classrooms to determine, well, for how long, for how many classrooms do I measure before measuring a non-classroom based on how many of each there are? Lastly, you can consider the occupancy among classrooms before sampling for your average CO2. As a note, these sampling strategies exclude transient spaces like lobbies, corridors, and restrooms, as they're unlikely to have CO2 issues and relatively little impact on productivity. Now here, we'll show an example of how we could find a school's average CO2 level based on this PNNL prototype of a primary school. 
if you want to say, well, students spend the majority of their time in a school day in a classroom. And so I only want to look at classroom spaces. You can leave out the computer lab, library, cafeteria, etc. Now we can deploy however many monitors we have randomly amongst all the classrooms. So here's what a potential random sampling among classrooms would look like. Now, if you want to also take into account non-classroom settings, again, this doesn't include transient spaces like corridors or lobbies, you can look at the ratio of classrooms to non-classrooms. So in this case, there are 29 classrooms and six other types of spaces, which means for about every five monitored classrooms, you can monitor uh, one other type. So um, that could be the computer room or the office or the gym. And so again, we randomly sample our first five classrooms and then now we sample a non-classroom. In this case, it is the office. Another option for measuring average CO2 levels in a school is using occupancy weighted measuring. This means that classrooms with high occupancy have a greater probability of being picked to monitor. Especially for instances where monitors are limited, it's a good practice pr to prioritize high occupant spaces with relatively long duration occupancy. And so what you can do first is find the typical occupancy of each classroom and weight each classroom based on its fraction of occupants to the total occupants in, the, in all classrooms. So as an example on the right, there are five classrooms, all with different numbers of occupants. And the one with the most number of occupants has a 33% chance of getting picked for monitoring, while the classroom with only 10 occupants has about an 11% chance. Using the PNNL prototype as an example again, Assuming we only want to measure classrooms when doing occupancy weighted measuring, we have classroom two with varying occupancies. For the purposes of simplicity, there's no hard number for how many students are in each classroom, but a sort of a heat map instead. Based on using occupancy weighted measuring, you can expect these classrooms to have a greater chance of being measured compared to the lighter red shaded classrooms. Now to sum up average CO2 testing, you can do random sampling or occupant weighted sampling and you can also choose whether you want to measure just classrooms or all regularly occupied spaces. Now keep in mind, these are just best practices for measuring averages in schools. We know that the number of sensors available varies from school to school. And so as a general recommendation, schools with less monitors can stick to random sampling of classrooms or use occupancy weighted sampling of classrooms. Now for finding the school's maximum CO2, there are some suggested areas of measurement. Obviously, we can think back to the list of sources that CO2 or high levels of CO2 come from in schools, and so that's people and low ventilation rates. The best practice is to use targeted non-random sampling prioritized based on potential maximum CO2 concentration. You can think of the cafeteria during peak hours where all the students crowd in for lunch, or places where you think there are particularly low ventilation rates and a high number of students. In this case, it's a cluster of classrooms that have a high occupancy and our core classrooms. Now, lastly, for determining a school's HVAC operating conditions, we can check for each HVAC or thermal zone, measure the classrooms in that zone, and check for similarities and differences. Then classrooms with unusually high CO2 levels should be checked for filter or insulation maintenance. You can also deploy monitors based on HVAC configuration, like in-duct sampling or return air measuring. In this prototype, there are sensors in the air duct based on the branch configuration of the HVAC system. To maintain well-ventilated classrooms, periodic ventilation system testing or continuous CO2 monitoring is recommended. Okay, now that we've measured where within a school to put your monitors based on your goals, we can look at where to place monitors within a classroom. In all cases, placing a monitor in the breathing zone of students is the best practice. You want to make sure the monitor isn't at the height of a student, but at the height of a sitting student. There's a lot of agreement in literature on placing monitors in the breathing zone of a seated student, but less agreement on where to place a monitor laterally within a classroom. This is because there are so many factors influencing monitor readings, and a big one is students tampering with the monitor or running around the monitor, causing inconsistent readings. There's also the issues of doors and windows opening, causing drafts that can disturb the monitor as well. From a literature review of measuring methods in schools, here's a list of places studies have put their monitors. People have placed monitors in the middle of the classroom, away from the students, and there are attempts to disguise them as furniture or have students know to stay away from them. To avoid annoyances, placing them near the back wall away from doors and windows works as well. You can also place them next to the teacher's desk, desk 
where there is less foot traffic and where teachers can keep an eye on device tampering. Now for monitoring the school's CO2 levels, ARC will give you recognition based on your floor area coverage, occupied time coverage, and measured performance. Let's go through what each of those mean. First is floor area coverage. Floor area coverage indicates the fraction of the school covered by all sensors. There are two ways to achieve this. First, users can assume that an individual sensor covers approximately 500 square meters based on the RESA air standard for commercial interiors or by following guidance from their vendor or product manufacturer. While sensor coverage will differ based on building layouts and installation practicalities, schools should aim for the smallest effective coverage area of a sensor and the coverage area of a single sensor should not exceed 500 meters squared. For example, at least one sensor in each HVAC zone or enclosed room could suffice for adequate coverage, provided those zones or enclosed rooms are smaller than 500 meters squared each. Next, depending on the school's measuring goal, users can divide their school into zones such that their monitor covers a percentage of occupied spaces or a percentage of classrooms. Users can also measure as a fraction of HVAC zones. As an example, users can divide their school into zones in accordance with the PNNL education building prototypes and what they define as regularly occupied rooms, such that their floor area coverage can be calculated as a fraction of the number of rooms measured compared to the total number of rooms. PNNL building prototypes considers the following as an occupied zone, a classroom, computer lab, office space, gym or stadium, or a general play area, the kitchen, cafeteria, or dining space, and the library. In this case, if you wanted to measure both the non-classrooms and classrooms, your floor area coverage would be the number you measured over 35 total occupied spaces. Here are the thresholds used to categorize floor area coverage into good, better, and best categories. So if you measured two classrooms and a library, out of 30 total regularly occupied spaces in the school, your floor area coverage would be 10%, which is considered good. Here's a layout of what good would look like in accordance to the PNNL school layout. If it's between 0 and 25%, then it's good. This shows uh, something between 25 and 75%, which is better. And then best is 75% coverage or above. Moving on to the second piece in recognition, occupied time coverage is a fraction of time covered by CO2 measurement during operating hours, during a measurement period of 90 days. For the purpose of measuring schools, we are assuming eight occupied hours a day of operations and one hour as a fundamental unit of occupied time coverage. Consequently, occupied time coverage is defined as a percentage of hours within a period that have one or more CO2 readings. This means that one day has a maximum of eight readings that will count towards occupied time coverage. For instance, if you measured CO2 for six hours every day for 90 days, your occupied time coverage would be 75%. These threshold values are the same as floor area coverage, where 0 to 25 is good, 25 to 75 is better, and 75 and up is best. Now the third piece of recognition is measured performance. This is based on CO2 thresholds. So for 350 to 800, this is good, um, as recommended by the CDC, ASHRAE, and SIPC 2018. They all recommended ventilation rates that result in 800 ppm or less. The upper limit is 1000 ppm, as effects on cognitive performance begin for short-term exposure, exceeding 1,000 ppm. ARC will take your overall measured data and see how often you fall into each category. So this example on the left, there are six hours in a day in the, and three of them are in the good range, two are unacceptable, and one is above 1,000 ppm, which is called investigate. This encourages mitigation strategies that can be as simple as opening a window or door. This means the concentration stayed under 1,000 ppm five out of the six hours, or around 83%, and so you would get 83 performance points. And so let's take a look at an overall CO2 comprehensiveness score example. We have a floor area coverage of 5% because one classroom out of 20 spaces in the school were measured. That gives you five points in the floor area coverage section. Then we have occupied time coverage, where six occupied hours out of eight total hours in a day were measured for 90 days. This gives you a 75% occupied type coverage. Lastly, with the same example as before, we have 83 points as five out of the six hours were under 1000 ppm. And here is what the end product would look like. You have all three scores out of 100. In this example, you can see that not a lot of area was covered, but they measured for a long time and had decent results. This certificate, on the other hand, 
which showed that the school measured a lot of areas, most of the occupied time, but had poor CO2 levels. Now to wrap up this section, we went over the negative cognitive impacts of CO2, the importance of measuring CO2 in schools, locations to measure within a school or within a classroom, the CO2 comprehensiveness score breakdown, and the certificate that you get for measuring. Now let's move on to the PM 2.5 guide for schools. So now we'll be talking about the health impacts of PM 2.5, particularly for students. This along with the uncertainty of PM levels will lead to the importance of measuring PM in schools. Next, we'll be covering the locations within the school to measure depending on your goals. Then I'll talk about the PM 2.5 comprehensiveness score breakdown so that you'll know what's included in your certificate. So just a quick intro into PM 2.5, it is fine particulate matter with a diameter of 2.5 microns or less. This means that the number next to PM indicates the diameter and less. Therefore, something like PM10 is anything with a diameter of 10 microns or less, which includes PM2.5 and PM1. On the right is a picture showing how small PM2.5 actually is. It's 36 times smaller in diameter than fine beach sand and 16 times smaller than human hair. Sources are mostly anthropogenic, as you can see from the list of sources in schools. It's emitted from gasoline and diesel-powered vehicles, fibers from clothing, calcium from chalk, and building deterioration. It's emitted from appliances like vacuums and stoves. This means that schools in urban areas are more prone to higher levels of PM2.5 from the heavy surrounding traffic. As you saw from the diagram before, PM2.5 is especially small. When we breathe in through our nose and mouth, the larger particulates usually get stuck in our nose hairs but the PM2.5 continues into our lungs. This fine particulate matter has the potential to continue deeper into our alveoli, potentially causing serious health consequences for the lungs and heart. This is why there are a lot of negative impacts on the respiratory system regarding PM. We can be exposed to heavy metals and products of combustion through inhalation of PM, increasing carcinogenic risks and asthma symptoms. In a study serving 6,590 children attending French schools where students were exposed to varying levels of PM2.5, it was found that the higher the exposure, the greater the, child, the greater the likelihood of the child experiencing asthma-related symptoms or having rhinitis or asthma. They've also been shown to cause respiratory and cardiovascular damage and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. In an eight-year study examining 1,759 children exposed to PM2.5 in Southern California schools, lung development was reduced in those who were exposed to higher levels of air pollution. As a result, there is a huge range of possible PM concentration and composition due to the variation between school location, building materials, and other variables in academic environments. Along with the negative health effects and multiple sources of PM, another reason to measure is its unpredictability. When investigating mitigation measures for other IOQ factors such as carbon dioxide, ventilation management is often a solution. But for PM2.5, in the nationally ventilated school in Palestine that was studied, there was no significant correlation between ventilation rate and PM2.5, nor for wind speed or PM2.5. In another study measuring IEQ in schools in Portugal, it was concluded that spatial variations such as outdoor location and cleaning practices impacted indoor air quality measurements more than any classroom factor, emphasizing the variability of PM levels and the need to measure more schools. And so our goals for measuring PM2.5 in schools is very similar to the CO2 guide. We want to support the health, comfort, and productivity of students and faculty, provide thresholds to promote the best practices for measuring, and have schools obtain recognition for monitoring. So let's look at locations within a school we can measure. Most of the time we measure because we want to know, well, how does the school protect students from ambient outdoor PM2.5? Well, there are a few things we need to consider. One of the bigger ones is the building's ventilation system. Sampling strategies are very different depending on the type of ventilation a school has. Today, we'll consider the mechanically and naturally ventilated schools. We can also think about our surrounding sources. Does the flow of traffic run along one of the edges of the school? Is there a parking lot or construction going on near the school? Lastly, we can consider indoor sources like flooring type, students resuspending PM through physical activities, or the use of cleaning supplies. Now, the top-line issue is thinking about the distribution of PM in and around the school and to be explicit about what you're looking for before selecting one of these goals. Let's take a look at mechanically ventilated schools and their potential goals for monitoring. 
First, maybe you want to investigate air handler filter effectiveness. We want to know how well the ventilation system protects the school from its surroundings. We could also be looking for how much PM is produced from human contribution or other internal generation modes of PM. From walking along the carpet to cleaning activities or even students shuffling with their clothes, PM can be resuspended into the air. There's a third goal of determining outdoor source contribution of PM2.5. If a user is interested in the ambient sources that infiltrate the classroom, this could be a potential goal for them. First, let's take a look at best practices for determining air handler effectiveness when measuring PM. Here we have a diagram of an air handler, usually on the roof outside. The air flows through this air handler into a low traffic area like a library. To find air handler effectiveness, we want to see the difference in PM concentration between ambient conditions and indoor conditions. We also want to make sure that the indoor concentration reading is away from high traffic areas so that we can more confidently say that the indoor PM reading is mostly attributed to the air from the air handler. And so first, one can place a PM sensor 5 meters within the air intake, as suggested by the RESA air standard. Note that these are only best practices, and so if there is only a limited number of monitors that a school has, you can use websites that tell you your general location's ambient PM concentration levels. Next, we want to place the sensor as close to the classroom's vent as possible. We want to make sure the monitor picks up minimal internal generation sources or traffic of people walking around to ensure accurate readings. A second monitor can be placed near the room to check for consistency. To better measure air handler effectiveness, make sure the space being measured is far from outside sources like vehicular traffic. This is to make sure there is little infiltration of PM through the envelope of the school. Now let's look at best practices for determining PM from human contribution or internal generation. You can see that we use the same setup as the air handler effectiveness strategy to establish a sort of baseline reading for PM 2.5. Then we want to measure a room with high occupancy in order to examine the differences in concentration between a low occupancy and high occupancy room. Both rooms should be away from known ambient sources, again, to ensure that the PM concentration can be attributed to the occupants or other internal generation modes. And for best practices, two monitors are placed in each room. Lastly, to investigate the outdoor source contribution of PM, like from gasoline powered vehicles, we can use the baseline of the air handler effectiveness again and compare it to a classroom near the ambient source with low traffic. Since it is a mechanically ventilated school, the difference between the baseline and the reading of the room near the source will show how much the PM infiltrates through the building envelope. Now moving on to naturally ventilated buildings. There's no air handler effectiveness strategy. Instead, we can prioritize our goals by occupancy or PM 2.5 source. Here's a table of potential strategies and goals for naturally ventilated schools. There are two common goals of measuring PM 2.5 within a school. One is to measure the infiltration factor of PM through a classroom's envelope and windows, or to again, measure for internal PM generation or human contribution. For natural ventilation in these cases, we need to assume the level and frequency of opening doors and windows is the same throughout the school. So let's look at a PNNL prototype layout of a primary school as an example for the strategies we can use. Now let's add an arrow showing where the vehicular traffic is. This is our outdoor source of PM2.5 pollution. Last thing, we'll depict occupancy through this heat map where the darker red spots are of greater occupant density than lighter pink classrooms. Now we have the first part of the 2x2 two two table, low occupant density and low PM2.5 source. If we find a place with low occupant density far from the PM2.5 source that we know of, we can examine the envelope and windows capacity to protect occupants from the outdoor surroundings. This would mean classrooms like this. We can measure outdoor and indoor PM levels to determine the infiltration. This next example can bring you to the same goal. If we examine a classroom with low occupant density near the PM2.5 source outside, we can see how natural ventilation brings PM2.5 inside and the extent of that. Now we want a low occupant density classroom so we don't have the internal PM2.5 generation included in our measurement. Activities like walking along the carpet can cause resuspension, interfering with the measurement. Now if a naturally ventilated school wants to determine internal PM generation and human contribution, they need to measure rooms with more humans. And so to avoid diluting the measurement with nearby sources, we should pick a densely occupied room 
far away from the ambient sources or other known sources. Lastly, this high occupant density and high PM2.5 source combination strategy can help determine the extent to which internal PM generation and envelope and windows contribute to the measurement. Assuming ventilation frequencies like opening doors and windows are the same, this is likely a classroom with the highest PM2.5 concentration, since PM comes from combustion sources, flooring, cleaning activities, and humans. Some other suggested areas of measurement to find maximum PM2.5 would be a first floor perimeter classroom, meaning an outward facing classroom along the edge of the school that's closest to vehicular traffic. Places like laboratories with Bunsen burners or kitchens with stoves can also be a potential area for maximum PM2.5 concentration. And for monitoring a school's PM2.5 levels, ARC will give you recognition based on your floor area coverage, occupied time coverage, and measured performance. This is similar to the CO2 um, guide for recognition. So for floor area coverage, the thresholds are the same as the CO2 one. Zero to 25 is good, 25 to 75 is better, and 75 and up is best. As a visual, using the PNNL prototype, this is good. This represents better because it's between 25 and 75% coverage, and this is considered best. And if you can remember from the CO2 thresholds, occupied time coverage is good in between 0 and 25%, better in 25 to 75, and best for 75 and up. Now measure performance. It still has good better and best, just like the first two, except 0 to 12 is best, 12 to 15 is better, and 15 to 35 is good. The limit of 35 is based on multiple sources, including EPA 24-hour standards. And so as an example, there are six occupied time measurements, where five of them are under 35 micrograms per meter cubed, and one of them is above 35, which is the investigate range. You will get 30, 83 performance points because five out of the six hours were under 35. And so just like the CO2 comprehensiveness store example, putting it all together, we have five points for floor area coverage, 75 points for occupied time coverage, and 83 points for measured performance. Let's see what that certificate will look like. Here, we have low area coverage, but with high occupied time coverage and pretty good measurement performance, as you can see from the three values on the certificate. Now this one, it has high area coverage, very high occupied time coverage, but pretty low performance because 12 out of 100 means that only 12% of the time, the measurements were under 35 micrograms per meter cubed. To conclude the PM 2.5 guide section, there are negative health impacts of PM 2.5. We showed the importance of measuring PM 2.5 in schools, measurement strategies, depending on your ventilation type in schools or your goals, and then the PN2.5 comprehensiveness score, which reflects floor area coverage, occupied time coverage, and measured performance. These have been guides for CO2 and PN2.5 measurement for schools. For more questions, you can email cpike at arcscoru.com or explore more solutions at www.arcscoru.com slash reentry. Thank you.